Major funding for these broadcasts is made possible by grants from New York Community Bank, Capital One Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Chase Commercial Term Lending, M&T Bank, Customers Bank, Genova Burns, Whitkoff, Greenberg Traurig. Additional support is provided by AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Aerial Property Advisors, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Laumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Citizens Bank, Collins Building Services, CPEX Real Estate Services, Cushman and Wakefield, DDG, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Fisher Brothers, First Nationwide Title Agency, Flushing Bank, Foley and Lardner, Friedman, Handler Real Estate Organization, HAP Investments, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Madison Realty Capital, Matone Group, Mercantile Commerce Bank, Meridian Capital Group, MHP Real Estate Services, New Banks, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rosewood Realty Group, SJP Properties, Sterling National Bank, Sterling Risk, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, The Continuum Company, The Moynian Group, and These Friends. Brooklyn, New York, Freeport, lacrosse, a nerd in high school, lucky he went to France, industrial engineer, Harvard Business, Sheffield Watch, Est, I'm going to be in the lease, in buying leases on buildings, I don't know, New York City, I have Steve Marigoff. Thanks for being here today. Thank you. So, Steve, tell me about your grandparents. They were tailors, right? They came from Russia uh, when there was no alternative but to leave Russia uh, in the early 1900s. My father's father was Boris. His wife was Pauline. Uh, She died right after they got married. Uh, My mother's mother was Tilly and her husband, Samuel. Uh, Samuel had basically tuberculosis, some type of a lung disease, and was constantly in and out of sanitariums. So my mother's mother basically went to work to support the family. My mother took responsibility for her younger sister, Shirley, and for taking care of the house and making sure food was on the table. And consequently, she didn't get to go to college, but her brother Leo did. They, they were in Brooklyn. Both sides of the family grew up in Brooklyn. And then you said to me, which was not unusual years ago, that the relatives, they married each other? My mother's mother was a widow, and my mother's, and my father's father was a widow. And Boris and Tilly then married each other. And I had two grandparents. It seemed very normal to me. You have a picture (laughs) of your father and his brother. Yep. And your father and his brother... My, your, my uncle, uncle Chuck was, was in the Navy, in and the my Navy. Father, was in, uh, father was in the Merchant Right. Bank. And your father, you told me, went to St. John's. He did. Uh, and he, at one time he worked at R.H. Macy. Where selling he, shoes. Selling shoes. And um, That's how he put himself through college, night school. And he went to St. John's in Brooklyn, and he yep. became an accountant. He did. And uh, Passed his exams the first time. Very unusual. All of them. So he, he becomes an accountant... And subsequently, um, how does he meet your mother? Um, My mother's mother, Tilly, sent her to New England up in Vermont to go to a work camp, basically, in those days, to meet guys, because that's where the guys hung out, and um, told her to bring a long black dress, which is what everybody would be wearing. Of course, nobody there was wearing a long black dress. They were all wearing shorts. Um, But my mother stood out. And my father took notice of her, and they got married. So they get married, 
And you're born during the war. You were born 44. in 1944. Yep. Originally, you're living like on Church Avenue in Brooklyn. Yeah, on Ocean Parkway, Ocean actually, Parkway. right on, off of Brooklyn, Church Avenue. Right off there. And we have a picture of you over there. And you said to me, when you were a little kid, you used to sing Yiddish songs? Well, well I was... I mean, from I what I'm told, we could have done this as the folks being Yiddish <laughs> we theater tonight. Okay? From what I'm told, I was one of the first kids born because, uh, you know, the war hadn't ended yet. And I guess I was conceived on leave. And um, so I was very, I got a lot of attention from a lot of the single, uh, the married women who were, you know, without husbands uh, who were fighting. And so... I got pushed in the carriage a lot, and I would sing Yiddish songs on Ocean Parkway and get a penny. Hey, you, that was the initial part of your That's what started it, show. started it all. <laughs> then your father, after he comes back from the, the war, your father joins the accounting firm of CD, uh, Seedman & Seedman, which yes. subsequently later becomes BDO Seedman. And then you move out from Brooklyn to the country. Well, People were, you know... People, it looked like you, the country. It looked like the country because there were potato farms not too far. You moved to Freeport. Right. So let's talk about growing up in Freeport. You know, you went to public school? Went to public school, Carolyn Atkinson uh, grade school, and then Freeport Junior High School and Freeport High School. Now, at Freeport High School, you said you were, you were a little bit of a nerd, but then there's this France situation, which we'll talk about, and sports. So tell me about France, this program that you did in France. I um, got elected uh, to be the Freeport Community Ambassador to France on the exchange program that was at that time called the Experiment in International Living. Now, why France? Uh, I was taking French, so the assumption was I could speak the language. I learned very quickly when I got there. So when did you go to France? Between my junior and senior years of high school. So during the summer? During the summer for, for uh, three months. And this was the awakening? You said no more Laurel and Hardy, no more... Well, what was the awakening was that um, it cost $1,000 at the time, which in 1959 or 60 was a lot a of lot money. A lot of money. And so they had to go around and raise that money from the Kiwanis, from the synagogues, from the churches. And whether they gave 25 50 dollars $100, I then had to go and speak when I got back uh, and thank them. And I did a slideshow, so I was on the road. Um, and when I came back, on I realized... On the road again. <laughs> on the road again. When I came back, I realized that every week they published my letter to the community. And I was a celebrity. So I could hide no more. And <laughs> So you were no longer <laughs> little Stevie in the corner. No you were I was, Steve in the public. Uh, that's it. Okay, and then we have a picture of your graduation. But when you're over there, you said you played lacrosse? I played lacrosse in high school and football, but primarily lacrosse. And, and then played lacrosse in college as well. And, and you're graduating high school, and you're not sure what you want to do, but Dad says to you, was a big influence in your life. He, was. he says to you that... You should become an industrial engineer. How that electrical happen? engineer? Electrical engineer. Well, Kennedy had announced he was president and announced that we were going to put a man on the moon before the end of the decade, and that gave huge uh, uh, impetus and urgency to electronics companies. And my father thought that I had an aptitude for engineering, but that it would not be a great profession for me. But if I took electrical engineering and then followed it with a business school education, I could be involved in companies that were on the cutting edge of what he thought technology was going toward. And he was right. So you decide to go to the best school in that category called Cornell. Cornell. I was how lucky. Come you, how come you didn't go to Stanford or something on the West Coast? I didn't know enough to apply to Stanford at that time, and I didn't get into MIT, so Cornell looked like a great choice. So you go to, you go to Cornell... Let's talk about those years at Cornell. I mean, this is the, the 60s, the early 60s. 62 to 66. Beatlemania. You know, it was an incredible time to be in college. Of course, Kennedy was assassinated, Martin Luther King. Uh, all of the, that four-year period of time from 62 to 66 was pivotal, I think, in the history of that, that century, really. Um, and I was lucky enough to be in college talking about stuff. Now, what are you doing during the summers at that time? I basically worked. A couple of summers I worked for my dad. At this time, was dad in, 
dad had gone into business with his brother, and they had started Marigoff and Marigoff. They did. Accounting firm. But you said to me that your dad was an entrepreneur and went into the pool business. Right. And the pool business had a double pools. Above ground pools. No, right. But it also, they were in the above ground pool business, but also in the billiard table, which is the former pool. Table. pool. Yeah, because they were countercyclical seasons. So, you know, they manufactured the swimming pools in the winter, and then they had no nothing to have the factory people do during the summer. So in the summer, they made items that sold well in winter, which were pool tables. They sold them through Montgomery Ward and Sears Roebuck. And so how do you decide after graduating Cornell that you wanted to, you, what I heard before is that dad said, go to business school. Yeah. Now, how do you decide to go to Harvard business school while you had this desire, perhaps from the, the, the days that you went to France to be an actor that you wanted to well, be I don't know what I did do with France, but I discovered acting in my junior year in, in college and, Fell in love with it as something to, you know, I would, even if I had a were bit you in, part. Were you in some productions at Cornell? I was in every production I could be in, and some bit parts, and I would still stay through the you entire know, You could have got your equity card. I, mean. I almost did. And um, decided I would apply not only to business schools, which was the plan, but also to the Yale School of Drama. And they accepted me um, in the lighting department. Uh, because I didn't have those chops that they needed in acting. And they said you could transfer if you're qualified into acting, and I thought that sounded great, so I called my dad and I told him that was my plan. And he said, but you've been accepted at the Harvard Business School and five other business schools. And I said, I know, but acting is really what I want to do. So he drove up, schlepped up to uh, Ithaca on Route 17 in the winter, and he said... You can't not join the best business fraternity around, which is the Harvard Business School. And he used reason, which was always <laughs> powerful for me. So I decided to change my mind. So you, you, you go to Harvard. You're there for two years. Talk about the two years at Harvard. The best business school in the country, no question. Yeah, I enjoyed the case study. Um, and what was the case study on, the, the major case study? No, they had case they had cases three to four a day. You'd right. have to read the case. You have to put yourself – at the very beginning of the Harvard Business School education, they said um, you're going to read cases two through three a day, and you need to talk about them and be prepared to talk about them the next day. And somebody said, from what position in the company? And they looked at them and said, well, from the president or the chairman of the board, obviously, which produced a lot of uh, very um, uh, uh, egotistical um, – business school graduates. I think it's much different now. I think now there's a lot more diversity. So now this is, let's see, 66? 68. 68. It's 1968. And at that time, there was something called the Vietnam War. Yeah. And many of us, I joined the Army Reserve. Other people joined the, you know, some of them taught. You know, there was a variety of things. And what do you do? I had done my master's thesis at Harvard on a company run by the Kennedy Foundation in conjunction with the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare that marketed products made by the mentally retarded. It was a wonderful company. And I uh, worked very closely with Eunice Shriver. And I asked Eunice if she would support my getting a three-year occupational deferment and I would work for that company. And that's what I did for three years. So you lived up in? Lived up in Cape Cod. Cape Cod, and you work for this company. So now it's 1971, yep. and you said, go west? Well, 19, yes. <laughs> 1971, you know, you, you, you were up in Ithaca, then you were up in Boston, then you were up in, Haya, you know, in Cape Cod, and right. now it's time you wanted, you wanted to change I took the weather? A, I took a drive around the country, came back, worked for my father in the early 70s at Sheffield Watch Company. Right. Uh, and... Um, uh, basically, you were director of marketing. At director of marketing. We had a an office on Fifth Four Seventeen Fifth, and then moved over to Three Thirty West Thirty Fourth, and then kind of packed it in, uh, took the money that I'd earned, and then I went west. I went to San Francisco. Right with the the short hair. With shorter hair, not really short hair. Yeah, I, I, I'm I'd only begun, kidding, you know. I'd begun uh, the early hippie age. <laughs> an early hippie. Yeah. So you're in San Francisco, and how do you get involved with Est, with Werner? 
and explain to my audience who who, who made me a different who, who, who Werner was and what Est was. Um, Est was a uh, two weekend training program in it getting it in yeah. transformation and in the experience of of what it was to really be alive and as a human being what it was to change your life and take responsibility for your life. And it seemed to work. Um, it worked well enough for it to be kind of a movement. And I fell in love with it. So I worked for them till the late 70s. You moved from San Francisco to Hawaii? I right? moved from San Francisco. They moved me from San Francisco to Hawaii, from Hawaii to Denver, uh, where I, I finally stopped. What's interesting is when you're at Est, you meet people who subsequently are going to have an involvement with your life and career later Correct. on. And at Denver, you decide to become a, uh, a real estate broker. Right. Uh, because you didn't have to be a salesman. You could go, go directly in to be a real estate broker. With, with course, course with, material. With, with courses. And you decided to be a broker and then get involved with doing something which not everybody was involved with, land leases. Well, no, tax deferred exchanges, tax defer right? And that connected me back with Jay Scheidler, whom I had become very friendly with in Hawaii, right? And then he asked me if I would start a company with him, and we chose New York, and we formed Meringhoff and Scheidler. This is what year? Nineteen seventy-eight. And so we started in nineteen seventy-nine. So you're in Denver. You you're doing the ten thirty-one tax exchanges. Right. Then Jay says, "Move east Move over east. here. Come back to New York." Jay is in Hawaii at this time? Yes, but he's forming a national company. Right, and that's the picture that, that we have of Jay and the different people running different divisions. Right. And we have that nice picture of you. Uh, the, the blue suit people. The, the blue suit <laughs> picture. And it, it's Jay on one side. There's a guy who's running New York, the guy who's running Los Angeles. San Francisco. San Francisco. Right. And you come back here, and what happens? Um, I... Find a building. We're, we're in the process of trying to sell uh, people on a concept called long-term master leasing. It actually Explain what that means to... It means that we would come in and give people who have a property that has uh, got management intensiveness a way of continuing to own the property, never having to sell it. But we would then take over the operations and give them one check a month, 12 months a year. And it works really, really well for some people. I meet a fellow named uh, Milton Schwartz, who's partners with two other people, Morty Rosenfeld and Larry Herring. Um, he owns a relatively small piece of the property, but is doing most of the work. There's a... There's a fire violation. The, the cornice is leaning, and there was a cornice that had fallen down on a Columbia co and killed her, and everybody was worried. And we came in, and we put a million dollars into the building to fix everything that needed to be fixed and but, took over. Now, but wasn't there a meeting with him at Engineers Club with your father? Yeah, he, I had no credentials. I had no experience, no track record, and very limited equity. Um, but he liked me. And um, my father said, why don't we have you come to the golf club at Engineers Country Club in Roslyn? And over breakfast and a game of golf... Milton thought I came from decent stocks, right. so he you're, gave me the... You're 34 the years business. of age at this time. <laughs> That's right. And uh, Milton... Uh, he liked me. He liked you, and he gave you the opportunity. Now, yes, he did. But as you said to me, Jay was your partner, but Jay wasn't here, and he said, you know, we have to, we have to close on this transaction. Right. And you then... You, you wanted to, let's say, the movie production. You went on top of a building. Well, Jay was unable to leave... Seattle, where he and his wife were waiting for a baby to be born uh, that they were adopting. So I said, I got to have an answer right away, Jay. And he said, why don't you make a movie? Now, this is no, it's not take a video on your phone. This was, so I went to the Yellow Pages, which was the equivalent of the internet back then, went to a video production company and asked a fellow named uh, uh, um, uh, David Burley if I could come to the top of his building on 419 Park and shoot a movie down on uh, down at 401 Park South, and I did, and that began an accumulation of long-term net leases that lasted for about five or six years. And what happens? What's the next? What's the next ev evolution of your career? Five. Or well, six I had years. gotten married. I had a child. We were thinking of having another one, and Jay was actually very interested in expanding into Boston, Washington, and wanted me to start expanding and leaving, you know, traveling. 
And I said, it's not, it's not my life plan, but I want to give you the opportunity to expand the Scheidler Group. So I formed my own company. And, and that was Maringoff Properties at that time. It was time. Maringoff Properties, and, but, but very quickly, um, in, a, in a stroke of what I considered one of the greatest uh, pieces of luck in my entire life, met Leslie Himmel. No, but before you met Leslie, uh, you, there was the Alex D. Lorenzo. Those were all happening with Jay Scheidler. So in the first part of the 80s, we met a number of people and accumulated a lot of net leases from Alex DiLorenzo, from um, Sidney Bernstein and Bennett Rose, people who, were, who had one or another different reasons for wanting to do a long-term net lease and let go of the ownership obligations of the property and still not sell. Then you meet Leslie, but how you meet Leslie is that Larry Silverstein had a course at the NYU Real Estate Institute, which is now called the NYU Shack Real Estate Institute, and it was the Silverstein course that uh, people would go to, and Harry Hemsley uh, was speak. he was the speaker that day, yes, he was. and you were sitting in the audience, and then there was this young, bright lady who worked for Integrated Resources at yeah. that time, and what happens? She always wore colorful dresses, and this was the kind of... Larry ran a course um, that even seasoned veteran real estate people would come to because it was always interesting. And you'd always have somebody talking about something, and you might learn something great. So the regular crowd came, and, and I noticed this young lady again, and she always asked the question, and I noticed that too. And, and, and Harry said, um, uh, are, there any, are there any questions? And, and, and Leslie stood up and said, Mr. Helmsley, what is your greatest achievement? And Harry looked at her and said, what are you doing later? And people laughed, and I thought that was really, that's a lot of moxie. So, so how do you, so you, you... So I offered her a ride home. And then? We started talking about whether or not we could do something together. She was working for Integrated Resources. I told her I thought she could be uh, a great partner and become wealthy, and she... Thought it was a great idea. And this is what? What year is it? 85. 1985. It's so our 30th year together. 30th year, this year together. So it's 85, and then you said to me, um, everything is moving well, and unfortunately, in business and cycles, there's the 1990s. And yep. what happens in the 1990s? Everybody I know is broke. Everybody in real estate I know is broke, and you can't borrow a penny. And you have certain things called the guarantee yep. that you owed to some banks. Yep. Leslie and I owed a lot of money and had a lot of outstanding guarantees. And all we wanted was the opportunity to work our way out of it. And uh, some banks gave us that opportunity. Some, for whatever reason, didn't and sold the loans to other people. We eventually went and bought them back. Right. Now, you said to me, you, you sat one day with Joe DeLuca. You know, who I believe was the chemical bank of those days. He was. And you, know, you have a good memory. And he, it, was a, it was a difficult time. <laughs> it was. But you were able to buy it back. And then, then you said to me that Alex had a, a little problem on some of his properties that you were able to buy back. Yes. Alex probably would not have let go of the fee interest, but he had made a, a lease, a number of leases with a fellow who um, had. Kathleen turned his husband. Jay Weiss, and uh, they had left New York, and, and one of those net leases was Happy Land, and a terrible tragedy occurred, and there was a fire. It was not, um, everything was not right with the permitting of the club, apparently, and that got both Alex and Jay into deep water, and uh, Alex subsequently then sold his fee interests to me. And this is what, 1995, would you say? I would say 95, yeah. So then you changed the business a little bit. You're buying. We had, Leslie and I had started buying fees in 85, 86, 87 because we had, we had money and the ability to borrow then. So we had accumulated a very uh, diverse portfolio of both long-term leases, fee interests, and partnership interests. And Leslie and I became very um, successful at buying back the loans that the banks that wouldn't sell them to us, had sold to other people. Now, w when you bought a properties, you were buying in, a, in an area that people said, hey, who wants to be in Midtown South? Yep. This was before Midtown South became chic 
as we would Well, say. I remember sitting in a taxi, and on the back of the taxi front seat, they used to have a map of Manhattan so that, you know, tourists could see where they were going, and they would name all the different areas. And the area I bought in was a big gray splotch that had no name on it. But today, it's, it's really where people want to be, <laughs> Midtown South, Chelsea. Lucky. So t- today, what is what is uh, Mer- Himmel Marengorf Properties do? What's the properties that you own? We've accumulated a wonderful portfolio of about two million square feet of secondary office that is highly desirable, um, more and more so. Um, when I say secondary, it's not so secondary anymore because the people that would go to what I call Class A, which is up on Park Avenue, really are not that interested right, in that they, space. They, they want to be in the They B-plus. want wide open concrete floors, you know, um, exposed ceilings. They like what we got. During the years, and fortunately things have been good, you've been involved, you, you created Maringo Foundation. The Maringo Family Foundation. Maringo Family Foundation. And you've also been, and we have this picture of you in pencil. Talk to me about pencil. Well, uh... Pencil is a, a, a company that I've gotten involved with. They're actually a tenant of mine as well. And they're collaborations between uh, business people and uh, public schools in the city of New York. And New York City public schools is really one of my main um, areas of interest in terms of philanthropy. Uh, we give away a lot of money every year to both public education and secondarily cutting-edge medical research. But New York City is really where we concentrate. So Pencil has a program called the Fellows Program, which I helped start, and it gives jobs to 150 to 200 kids every year, public school kids, for pay uh, in great companies, uh, JetBlue, uh, Cooper's uh, Library and Price Waterhouse Coopers, whomever they are today, and other companies ourselves. We take three uh, uh, fellows every year, Deconic uh, Real Estate does too, and Great, great uh, chance for a kid to really Let's talk about get family. experience. Family? Let's talk about the girls. I have four daughters. And what, what are their names and what are they doing today? My eldest daughter, Tori, teaches preschool uh, in, at the Brooklyn Kindergarten Society in Brooklyn. Um, my second daughter is a uh, candidate for a master's degree at NYU in educational psychology. She's going to become a psychological social worker. My third daughter is about to begin taking an occupational therapy master's, also at NYU. They'll both have master's degrees. And my youngest daughter is uh, becoming a senior in the poly prep high school in Brooklyn and is struggling, like everybody else, to decide which college she will grace with her presence. And yeah. you're engaged? I'm engaged to a wonderful woman named Kim Charlton. And um, I'm very fortunate to have discovered that kind of love this late in life. So it, it's interesting, you know, you could have stayed over there on Ocean Avenue, Ocean, uh, Parkway. Ocean Parkway and Church Avenue, uh, singing for the Yiddish Theater. <laughs> uh, I could have. Okay, or, or, or been an electrical engineer and, you know, maybe been in the, the space capsule business, you know, with the NASA. Uh, and fortunately, uh, the trip to San Francisco uh, was helpful because it created the initiative to push you to meet certain people, and those people, you know, everything is fortuitous in life, okay? Or as we say, sometimes it was Bichette yep. to be there, and I'd like to say thank you for being here today. Michael, thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it.